No. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm Kalpana. I'm a co-founder of Metome Science Informatics, which is a company that works in the bioinformatics and knowledge mining space, knowledge mining specifically in the life sciences. Um, my talk today, and I'm going to dwell a little bit on, you know, on, on the title here. It says, Open Data in the Life Sciences and Open World. Uh, open data might be a little bit of a misnomer. I'll be talking about linked data, but if linked data is open data, then it makes for a more open world. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about open world. Uh, an open world assumption in a data model is slightly different, is different from a closed world assumption in that in an open world assumption really any, uh, there's this thing which they say it's called AAA. Anybody can say anything about anything. Which means you put your data out there in the web and you can connect it to existing data and you can make whatever assertions assertions you want. So then what that really boils down to is trust. Do people trust your data? Do they trust that linkage and then you know then they will use it and if not, so you need whenever you put up something to associate provenance and where did it come from? and keep it in, in a graph that is, you know, that can be uh, included or excluded. So that's sort of what I mean by an open world modeling system. Um, so I sort of got a little ambitious here. I uh, will give, because there are not a lot of people who work with linked data or uh, so semantic web in this area. So. I want to give a very brief introduction. It's very superficial, but that's all I can sort of cover in the time. Uh, then talk about our efforts in the life sciences and uh, you know the kind of challenges we face. And then finally show you a demo of our product. So if I put throw the word mercury out at you, what does it mean to you? What comes to your mind? Planet. Poison. Okay. Metal. Metal. Anything else? Version control. Version control. Version control, exactly. Anything else? Thermometer. Thermometer. Thermometer, correct. Okay. So, it means different things to different people, right? So, if you were a connoisseur of the art, or a um, mythology fan, you would think of like Mercury is a figure in Greek mythology. Or there are a lot of art sculptures <coughs> that depict Mercury. Or it could be the planet, as many people say. And you know, whom that makes in a different concept, a context if you're an astronomer, or even astrologers talk about something in Mercury and something in Venus and Earth too. And then again, temperature uh, or the element, which is mercury as a metal. And then, you know, mercury could be a car as well. So it really depends on what you're talking about. So, here you got your version control as well. If you were a developer, you would look at version control. And so, this is a quote that I really like. You know, when you look for something or, you know, you have words, you usually associate them with what is your context. So if your knowledge and my knowledge <coughs> are different, then based on, you know, but you go to Google he, Google or any other search engine which is doing a keyword search, they don't know what your context is or my context is. They will throw up search results based on what you ask. So. What we expected might be very different from what we were really looking for. But what if you typed in Mercury in your search box and you were asked, are you interested in the planet Mercury? Are you looking are you a chemist looking to study the element Mercury? Are you art canizer? You might be looking at sculpture or developers like you might be just looking at Mercury. 
So if you were able to ask a question like that and get an answer something like this, where this little green ball here depicts Mercury and you are able to go to a database, to the geo database and get all the information about Mercury, get spaceships, uh, space satellite information about Mercury and then connect Mercury back to the solar system and be able to get more information about the solar system that it belongs to. Then you have, you see the planet in its complete context and you see the information that you're looking for because you were able to choose initially and say this is what I want. Or if I went into a little more, sorry. So if I looked at the solar system, the solar system has an object, which is Mercury, which is an astronomical object. It also has Venus and Pluto. And Mercury has a type associated with it, which is a planet. It has certain atmospheric elements. It has a crater. And it has certain characteristics. So Mercury would have certain properties associated with it, which would be purely data. And it could be connected to other objects. right? which were associated with the solar system or a galaxy. So this is the type of information that is stored in the linked data space. And this is the type of information that we attempt to search for in the linked data space. And all this will make a little more sense to you if I go ahead and tell you how information is stored in the linked data space. <coughs> Excuse me. Information in the linked data space is stored as what we call a triple. And a triple is basically nothing else but a subject, which could be a person or an object like Mercury, <coughs> a predicate, which specifies a relationship, and an um, object, which is another, uh, another entity. So for example, a person could be related to another person, a planet could be related to the solar system, etc. So this is how all data is represented in the linked data space. And here, an example of this, the solar system has an object, Mercury. And Mercury is of a type planet, right? So these are assertions that you make about your data in that whole space. So. What this allows you to do is actually explicitly state a lot of things about your data, um, but it has a flip side. Your data is extremely verbose. For example, if you went from the relational database table, every cell in a relational database table is actually represented in the linked data space by a triple. So it's a lot more expressive, but it's very verbose. And here, there's a little bit that I want to tell you about. Every, um, every entity in the linked data space, for example, if it, if it was in, if in Mercury, we continue with our example, is actually stored <coughs> in uh, what you call a namespace, which is really a graph that is containing information about astronomical objects. And that would be called, uh, that could be called, say, astro. However, if you were looking at Mercury in the chemistry space, it would be stored in another graph, and that graph would have a pre, uh, would have a name chem. So, if you prefix every entity with what we call as a namespace, which is astro or chem, then you <coughs> are able to identify it as such. So that's the sort of okay. So you can really do cool things with this triple. That's the nice part about it. For example, <coughs> if you um, said a uh, solar system belongs to the galaxy Milky Way, then it also implies that Milky Way contains, an, uh, 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 contains a solar system. So how do you, you can actually say, you can actually declare that any relationship has a valid inverse relationship. For example, uh, to give you another example, if you say A, Mary is Sue's daughter, then it implies that Sue is Mary's mother. So you could say that has daughter has an inverse relationship, which is has mother. So you can state such things 
<coughs> in your uh, ontology. So when you start searching your data, you can actually start uh, pulling up a lot of things which are not were never explicitly stated in the first place. So you start looking at relationships that weren't explicitly stated in the first place. Okay. The other thing is transitive. So you, we all know that the moon orbits the earth and the earth orbits the sun. So the moon also orbits the sun it, because, I mean, we, I don't have to explain that to you. So <coughs> in a transitive search, uh, you can say that the, uh, the relationship orbit is a transitive property, which means that if the moon orbits the earth and the earth orbits the sun, then that implies that the moon orbits the sun. So you, these are assertions that we make in our data, that if this relationship exists, then this relationship is implied. And this actually makes, <coughs> put, uh, makes it very expressive, the information contained in your data, and it's very easy to query your data. So this is like a really short history lesson. So how did we get here? So if you looked at like the initial uh, you know, evolution of the web, you, web was all about linked documents. But soon, <coughs> we started with the social web, where I, I don't think, you know, it's been around so much part of us that I don't think we remember a time before there was a social web, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that, which is a, which is a participatory web, where there were blogs and people talking to people. Uh, but then, what people, some people call Web 3.0 is uh, the web of really deep data that exists and a web of structured data. Where infant data is connected <coughs> at a very granular level. And that data and the uh, social, uh, you know, Web 2.0, which is the participatory web, it is probably these two that will be, you know, uh, will dictate the technologies that are there in the future. So, um, the gods of semantic web would strike me dead if I don't show you the layer cake because every semantic web uh, presentation has to have a layer cake. But uh, this isn't particularly useful except that it gives you some idea about the architecture of any semantic web application. So at the very bottom of this is a URI or an IRI. So every object in the semantic web is <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, excuse me, uh, has a unique HTTP URL associated with it. For example, if, if there's this person Barack Obama, Barack Obama has a specific URI associated with him. On top of that is the RDF and the XML layer. The XML or the RDF layer is that layer of relationships that we just talked about, where every U URI or every entity is connected to another entity. And then out here, the OWL and the RIF layers are basically the logic that we talked about, the inverse relationships and the transitive relationships and the rules that we put in so that we can actually infer further from our data. And then there is trust or provenance, how uh, useful is that data? And on top of this whole stack, you build user applications. So what are the principles of linked data, basically? And these are, I mean, again, if you are in that space, you start looking at it. Every everything has a URI associated with it. Uh, URIs are um, use HTTP protocol, so you can actually look them up. Uh, when you have a URI, other people link data to it, and um, and that's actually the most important. And this is sort of like now, uh, you know, uh, the five star data badges that people have started giving to link data. Uh, these are standards that have evolved from the W3C, which is put your data out on the web, um, make it machine readable, use non-proprietary formats so that it can be accessed easily, 
use standards and the W3 standards are usually RDF uh, and then link your data to other people's data and this is sort of like a five star data dating. So, you know, if your data follows all this then it's given this five star badge and people have started using this a lot to... Uh, so what has been happening in this space is people have started putting their data out there. It started as a small cloud in 2007 where there was DBpedia and some geography stuff, census data and things like that. But this kept growing. So in 2007 it became considerably bigger and the bio guys got in here with OpenSight. That was where we... As we went further, uh, this web grew even further, and so it's kind of been explosive. And right here in this space is where all the biology data sits. And biologists have been um, sort of early adopters of the semantic web for the simple reason that they have been generating so much data, they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to link it up. They knew they needed to sort of link it up to make sense of it. So. That's the reason. So semantic web in the life sciences, and this is really what we do. What is our vision of semantic web in the life sciences? Um, so so it, it sort of has two parts. One is there is a lot of data coming out of research. And for those of you who heard um, Ramesh's talk in the morning, he was talking about genomic data there's drug data coming out, there's clinical trials data coming out, there's a lot of data coming out and this data has to be linked for you to make sense of it. Because this data traditionally is all sitting in silos. So now there is a huge push that you need to link biology data so that it can, so that when it connects to each other, you know, knowledge maps will emerge and people will be able to look at new things. And, you know, so sort of, be able to harness the collective intelligence that is there in science out there. But there is another aspect to this whole thing, which is in the healthcare. Uh, you, you know, there are these buzzwords that go around nowadays in the medical profession, which is like translational medicine or personalized medicine. And what this really means is, uh, is the medicine that you take if, even if it helps you, is it going to help me even if I have the same disease? It may not, but because you and I have different uh, genetic makeup. So what what is going to happen as more genomes get sequenced is physicians can actually make very focused decisions as to whether that medicine is going to be good for you or you know, it's not going to work with your profile at all. Are you going to have an allergic reaction to it? The things that are also lifestyle issues. You know, um, if the medication you're uh, taking is it going to have an adverse effect with alcohol? Does it have an adverse effect with some other medication you're taking? These are all issues that, at this point of time, actually physicians don't even consider. It's kind of scary. But if you go to a doctor, a lot of questions they don't really ask you. You know, they just prescribe medicine because it suits some broad spectrum. Um, and then patients themselves, you know, uh, especially people with sort of lifelong diseases often become their own sort of caregivers. They need to know a lot of information. They need support communities where data is stored. So patients themselves, so data needs to be linked so people can actually discover it. And what kind of questions would people ask? I mean, scientists scientists are constantly looking at old data to see if the drugs that they discovered like 40 years ago could be used for something else new now. Um, also, um, can the drugs be made to work in a different way? Can it target some other part in the body, some other proteins in the body? And by looking at existing data, can I come up with new hypotheses? Because when I link up these, this data to new patterns emerge. So this is sort of the whole science focus. Patient, I mean, this is something you might want to know immediately, you know. You have, you've gone out, you've had a drink, you have a headache, there's a particular painkiller you take. It, depending on, you know, different things, you, you could actually have like a fatal uh, lethal reaction because 
a lot of reactions, adverse uh, drug uh, effects that happen with acetaminophen, which is the crocin, which all of us swallow every time we have a headache. So, you know, you sometimes need to be able to find out these things. Uh, so, ecosystem right now is really driving towards this whole linked open data thing. Uh, if you look at um, like <coughs> Europe, there's a, like the Open Fact, Pistosia Alliance, there's a whole bunch of places which are pouring money saying, put your data out there and you know, we will provide the infrastructure. So, there's like a huge opportunity for people like us to play. Because we can then, you know, re look at that data and make sense out of it. Uh, apart from that, even two years ago, you know, audio standards were not uh, really um, mature enough to develop stable applications. But now it's a lot better. And then uh, genome sequencing. Genome sequencing is the huge driver. I know I sort of talked about it in every slide. But when your genome costs like, and they're talking about thousand dollars to sequence a genome, when that kind of data starts coming out, then you know the amount of information that you can start gleaning from this data is huge. So these are the drivers from the ecosystem. Pharma industry now, pharma always have to hold on to their data. It was all behind closed walls, and, but pharma pipelines are driving, driving up. A lot of patents are expired in, in the next whatever. I think 2012 was the time a lot of patents expired. So what to do? They have to pull their, their pre-competitive intelligence to be able to actually come up with new jobs. So what you know? So now a lot of their old data is actually being put out there. Uh, and big pharma like AstraZeneca, Eli Lilly, they're all putting their data out there. So these are the drivers from the ecosystem. So what kind of questions can you ask then of this data? If you had information about aspirin and its target protein in the body in one database, and Tylenol, which is your closest, and another target protein in another database, could you then walk across these two databases to see what are the common proteins between aspirin and Tylenol? Or do two drugs work the same way? Do they have common function? Do three drugs work the same way? How does a drug work in a disease? Essentially, you can slice. So the whole deal is you can slice and dice your data in any way to get the answers that you want. And that is where you know the whole power of this technology lies. So are there challenges? Um, generally, there are a lot of challenges in the linked data space. I I'm going to talk about the challenges in biology. Uh, I'm going to focus on two of them, which is the semantic variation and um, and trust. But I will talk about other things. When people make these graphs, right? Whenever there's a different context, you have to be able to say that the protein in this graph of data is the same as the protein in this graph of data. You should be able to match these. It's like matching schemas across databases. And it can become an extremely messy um, and inaccurate job. And that's, that's one of the big challenges. The second challenge is actually uh, a little easier. But if you look at this thing, which says CDK1, it's a well-known protein in biology. It can be written in all these ways. CDK-1, CDK-1. And no big deal. It's a syntactic variation we all have, you know, it can be easily dealt with. But this is where it's harder. These things also mean CDK1. Cell division, control protein, two homologs, where did that come from? You know, all these things mean the same thing. And this is because everybody who works with a particular entity in biology and biologists are notorious, will give it its own name. And but they all the same thing. So then how do you resolve this kind of ambiguity? So this is like a huge issue in biology where name variants. This second issue is actually an issue that is common against all the name data space. 
Suppose I looked at aspirin and I said, what are the proteins that aspirin reacts with? What are the proteins that this protein reacts with? What are the molecular function? What is the drugs and what is the sequence? Then, if I wanted to look at how reliable this data was, then this path needs to be reliable, this path needs to be reliable, and this path needs to be reliable. So the trust that you would place on this piece of data depends on the trust that you would place on each of these things along the path. So then, how do you calculate provenance? How do you assign provenance to something? And the only way you can do it is actually, well, there are different ways. People have come up with different models and different theories. But, uh, you know, so you have weighted nodes and you say, you know, this if it comes from this node to this node, you would trust it more. But uh, the way we have dealt with it is, uh, if you look at this D1 here, it could be a bunch of sources which assert this fact that link aspirin to a bunch of protein. So it could be a set of you know D1 to D1, a bunch of sources. We we'll say we tell the user, you choose the ones that you, you trust. And then we'll calculate the part that way. And we found that that's easiest. But there are, so this, this is an issue that we haven't solved entirely. I mean, we haven't solved it at all. We just left it to the user, actually, to do it. Uh, and this is an issue that continues to plague all data that you get from the linked uh, uh, data world. And this is this whole issue of trust and that semantic unit cake that we looked at. So, uh, I will move on to tell you a little bit about our platform. Uh, we have taken a bunch of proprietary databases in the biology space, converted them into linked data form, and then we have an engine that actually queries across these databases and so shows you the results. And I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I'm actually going to go and show you a demo, so I will do that right now. This, this little bio was developed by Meto, uh, and I'm just going to show you a quick demo to show you some of the things that I was talking about. So we'll start our search with metformin. Metformin, do any of you know what metformin is? What is it? It's a sugar control. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad that I mean. It's good that you don't know it. That means only sugar levels are under control. So metformin is a diabetes drug. And if I just typed in metformin and hit a search, I would get this kind of information about metformin. which is that it's, it's a drug, it's an approved drug, it's anti-diabetic, etc. And if you look at this graph that is generated, it would take metformin. The form? Oh, that, yeah, but it will get. Can you guys see it all? Is it visible? I, can't. I don't know what you can see. So, so basically, if you look at metformin, it will give you all the patents that metformin has, the reference publications, what is it used to treat for, and it's obviously it's used to treat things other than diabetes. What are its targets? Protein targets, and what drugs does it interact with? Then do this again. Okay. Now let's just go ahead and do a new query. If I looked at metformin, 
And now I'm not going to look at protein target, but I want to cast a wide net. So I'm saying that any protein that my formula is related to in a loose way, I'm going to type protein here. And I'm going to cast a loose net and say any protein that um, my formula is related to, can I have the biological processes that those proteins are involved in? So here I'm saying, I, my, pro, my drug of interest is my formants. I'm now building a link query. Um, and so I know there's a lot of biology jargon here, but I'm trying to sort of simplify that so you get the idea. Um, metformin interacts with some proteins in a very loose way. It's related to some protein. And this, these proteins have some biological functions. Can I find out what they are? So I go ahead and hit search. And the reason I did this was because you remember we said metformin is used for diabetes. But there were a lot of there's been a lot of talk. Can this be repurposed to be used for cancer? So as a biologist it's also used for PCOD cancer and several other things. For what? PCOD. So basically one way to find out is is it involved in um, apoptosis, which is like a cancer process. <coughs> so I'm gonna click on these biological processes and see. And so if I look at this here, it says it's it's working on DNA damage, apoptosis, which is like the cancer process. So it does look in a very loose way like the proteins that are uh, related to metformin are involved in the cancer process. So could I extend this further? So I go back and I modify my search and I click on the protein because that's where I want to extend this and say this from. So I could extend it from any node and I say are these proteins involved in cancer? So I click on cancer. And so now I have a query that says metformin has a bunch of related proteins. These are some biological processes. And is this protein also involved in uh, cancer? Are these proteins also involved in cancer? So where I'm driving at this, can metformin actually be used to look at cancer? And if you look at that, you see that these proteins are involved in several types of cancer. <coughs> right? There's like colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, etc. So casting a very sort of wide and loose assumption, you could start investigating the fact that maybe metformin is, could be used for cancer. So what I'm trying to drive at is none of these assertions were made in our data anyway. What really we did here was we looked at linkages across the data to look at patterns and relationships and start building an initial hypothesis before you go into like going and experimenting with it. So this is the sort of uh, power <coughs> that the linked data process really has. You know, you're able to look at a whole bunch of things that, uh, you know, may not be apparent in a closed world system. So various things you can do with this interface. If I click on one of those proteins, then I'm able to sort of filter down these proteins. I can now, uh, and it filters down these things too. So this is sort of from one of the things. I can also say that I'm interested in some of these proteins. Um, so say this one, and do you have a favorite, do any biologists in the audience? Any biologists in the audience that are interested in any of these? 
So can you look at cell cycle proteins? Sure. Can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. It's for people to see it on the screen. So I'm gonna. I've got the Go biological processes highlighted, and I'm going to just type set set Did you guys do the metadata? How did you get all the different data sets that you're talking about? So the data sets that we got, we are all public domain data sets. What we do is we're extracting the metadata from different data sets. And we, we do a mapping process where we map those to what we call a meta-ontology. And the meta-ontology is built by domain people. Because the meta-ontology requires a certain understanding of the domain. Certain relationships you will get it directly from the data itself. But certain things like those asserting which are the transitive relationship or which are appropriate inverse relationship, that that layer of metadata gets built by the main experts. So we have an underlying spark. Um, we have we use virtual so which is a data store. And we use Sparkle to search, and the engine that generates is Sparkle that's ours. So we built that. The queries to the underlying database that's ours. We built that. Any other questions? Maybe more interesting, maybe more interactive. Yeah. So the, would would this eventually lead to analysis, or you just give away the the data and the linkages, and then this is. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. And uh, the rest is left for the user to. Uh, yeah. So, so first of all, you know, we don't make any claims about these assertions. We're saying this is where they're getting it from. And uh, you could use certain tools like Blast, and if you're a biologist, you know, certain bioinformatic tools on top of this, and that is a close thing that we're beginning to integrate slowly into our. Uh, yeah, uh, Blast and PDP Viewer are already in We already have Blast and PDP yes. uh, okay. Viewer. And we're going to do very basic things like cluster W, maybe R for statistical analysis, that kind of stuff. But we won't be doing the analysis. That's up to the user. Yeah, what I'm asking is that uh, would the user be able to be in your system, embedded system, get the analysis done, whatever he chooses to be? I mean, for example, he's chosen all these words like. Oh. Morphine and cancer. Yeah. So unless otherwise he has some background knowledge, he's not going to go and check for it. Simple as that. Yeah. The researcher. So would he then have a uh, something in his system to further go and find out the the relationships? You know the statistically uh, uh, significant associations. Okay, so right now we are doing the associations that he can find out. Okay. What is statistically significant? Yeah, it mm -hmm. will be possible in a future release, mm -hmm. but we don't have that yet. So that that is part of the plan that we do okay. look at what is statistically significant. Ah, okay. okay. We can so, do something very yeah. similar to the page rank based okay. on the graph mm -hmm. that is available and the connectivity that's available. Okay. So we don't quite have that yet, but that's sort of the. Uh, and okay. also, you know, uh, public data has its ups and downs. Right. So, um, you know, that I'm, I mean, I'm actually open to suggestions here. How does one rank those public databases? Maybe we could discuss. Yeah, later. so that's, yeah. So that brings so. another question, please. Uh, so is it real-time data? No, this is not real-time data. So this is existing data. Right, so but so existing yeah, data so also updates, right? So yeah, when those databases update, they update, yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's, okay, okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, but again, the next thing that we've been asked is real-time data when we go to the healthcare thing starts coming in from like patient records. So will you be able to handle this? And that again is something we think about for the future. Yeah, the other thing is people can actually put up their own data. You have a question? Yeah, so when you said that you have a sparkle as your search engine, so that means you're 
throwing the queries through Sparkle through various public databases. Yes, sir. Or you aggregate the database, you store it. Yes, sir. That's uh, actually two sides to the story. Right now, because of these Sparkle endpoints being a little iffy, we have aggregated it. <coughs> but we do have another version where we can go to different, which is called Data Federation. So what I showed you now is the warehouse. Any other questions? So if you change the underlying data to some other domain, for example, let's say libraries, would the same search engine handle? Yeah, yeah. So that so there? basically uh, the issues would be with the front end where we start auto suggesting and the auto suggestion is domain dependent. The suggestions that are coming up. So if you were able to tell us the vocabulary in your domain and the ontology was associated with your domain, then the search engine would work. I mean, we went and put it on top of a publisher's uh, Sparkle endpoint, and it worked because we were able to automatically extract their schema and then do that mapping. So, so the, I can see that in a library also it will be very useful. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Where if you're reading one book, you want to find out what are the related books. And yeah, uh, sure, sure, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. different spaces that Right now, uh, we are beginning to start working with content providers, so libraries would be right along that line. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, who are your potential users for something like this? So, potential users are anybody right now for at the level that this is at, which is only at the end of the science uh, community. Uh, would be scientists who could be in like large government labs, mm -hmm. cancer labs, or people within the pharma and biotech industry. Okay, so it's not something that encourages uh, self-diagnosis? No, no, uh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> would that be useful? <coughs> I don't think self-diagnosis is a good idea at any time. And I think <laughs> this wouldn't ever lead to that either way. No, no, no. I mean, you can't stop people from doing self-diagnosis. I mean, even I do it, but it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> it's not something I encourage. So, uh, what is the level of manual creation when you're actually gathering the data to link the objects? Yeah. So, uh, Ram, you want to take that because Ram, this is Ram, my co-founder, he's been dealing with the data stuff. Yeah, the question was what level of manual curation goes into it. Yes. So, <clears throat> There's a bit of things like, for example, the semantic and syntactic variations that Kalpana talked about. So uh, some at some level is very hard. So we have our own certain indices which are sort of partly manually done. And uh, we try to uh, uh, automate as much as possible in the scheme of things. But definitely, yes, there is a manual component involved in sort of doing this stuff. But it's not huge. It's just small. Yeah. So effectively, we can rapidly turn around any data store once we understand the schema pretty quickly. Yeah, but then, but uh, essentially, what I'm asking is, what is the level of errors you might find when you're actually suggesting something like that? Right. So uh, the, uh, the point is, we do not uh, make any interpretations of the original data. So one of the things is that we deal with primarily structured data. So we go to places like Drug Bank, Uniprod, etc. So the reason for that is that you know that the column name or the attribute that you have explicitly tells you Was what kind of relationship. Was that your question? Are you wondering how much error is introduced by manual curation? It's a part of it basically. Part so uh, when you're not, uh, when you're automating it basically, you might introduce more errors. No, uh, actually if you do, uh, I mean you can argue the flip side too that if you're doing actually an automated process, and you start like sort of doing some kind of NLP or IR uh, based technique, then how uh, are you sure that whatever is coming out is right or not? So effectively, we don't we try not to do any interpretation of the data that is available, and we deal primarily at this point of time with structured data. So it's very clear as to what the relationship is, and that's how we do it. So uh, for example, if you notice the targets example that Kalpana was talking about, Drug Bank specifically says that these are the targets for X and Y. Uh, drugs. X and Y are targets for the drug. Whereas if you go to farm GKB, it just says it's related. So we use the same terminology even to say that this is just a relationship. It's an ambiguous relationship. It could be that there's no causality involved over here. So we do not say well, what is the cause or not. But you talk about farm GKB and then it gives you the actual statistical relationship, right? So right. which is directly uh, useful to your research or whatever project at hand. Right. Whereas so, this 
So uh, that's the other part. I think uh, Kalpana didn't sort of go into showing how we display the sources. So we can sort of show you how we do that. Okay. So we say this oh, comes yeah, from this particular like source. And what we're trying to do <coughs> next is sort of show actually where is, is there a publication? Where does it come from? You know, is there a score that the right, original database associates with? So the still the researcher has to go to that publication and doesn't have to. It. We'll show it here. Okay. In the context wherever it's available. With the data that is given in that publication curated and uh, as far as the, the original database provides it, for example, farm GKB for saying that this is related to this drug is related okay, to this target. Yeah, so it says this is the paper or if it points to a particular paragraph, we can show it directly. But we will not go and look at the okay. original paper and say this is where it's coming from. So we rely essentially on multiple data sources to show it. So it's like a combination <coughs> of a search engine and a data, or it's just a single search, search engine? So it's an integration platform, and we allow people to search and form queries seamlessly across these data sources. We are not doing sets. any curation of literature at all. That's not the business we are in at all. So we are not taking unstructured data in literature. Yeah, that's another component altogether. Yeah. Yes. So there are a lot of people who do that. So that's a different business plan and business. Uh, and unstructured data is a completely different volume. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a different. So we are using metadata from places like PubMed, etc. Mm -hmm. So sort of bring this thing together because uh, structured data by itself, the volume is very less. Water. I think water here, some 